if you'll open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy, please, chapter 26, before we get into our message, just to prepare for receiving the tithes and the offerings a little bit later. Here in Deuteronomy 26, uh, the Lord is speaking of one of the feasts that he had established. It was called the Feast of First Fruits. And he says in the first few verses, And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today the Lord your God, to the Lord your God, that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a great nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice, and looked on our affliction and on our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us up or brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So, great testimony of worship and honoring the Lord with your first fruits. Well, let's turn to Romans, please, chapter 7, Romans 7, and let's stand together as we begin our study read a few verses as we normally do and pray, and we'll get into the study. If you need a Bible, if you'll just slip your hand up in the air, please, one of the ushers will be happy to get a Bible for you. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man." Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, or before we were saved, the passions of sins which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Lord, we thank you for the newness of the Spirit, the newness of life to those who have life through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for sustaining us, we thank you for feeding us that in our new life in Christ, we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ and that we might draw near to you. 
We thank you, Father, for the promises we were singing this evening that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And so, Lord, we ask, first of all, that you might wash us personally of any sin within our life. You know what those sins are, and we just quietly in the quietness of our own heart would acknowledge, Lord, our constant need for forgiveness, and we pray that you might forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless now our minds and our hearts this evening, teaching us about Christ, helping us, Lord, to know how to follow him, that we might be conformed into his image. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Paul begins this chapter by speaking most likely to Jewish brethren who were in Rome, as he says in verse 1, or do you not know brethren, and then you'll notice the parentheses, for I speak to those who know the law. So speaking, first of all, to the Jewish believers in Rome, and he begins to explain, as he mentions in the last part of verse 1, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And he goes on then to introduce a metaphor to describe what the Christian's relationship was like before they became a Christian and what their relationship is like now that they have become a Christian. That relationship, first of all, to the law before they were a Christian, and now the relationship after they've become a Christian to the law. So he's not really teaching on marriage, but he's using the, married, the metaphor of marriage to speak of the unity that one has when they're married and then the freedom to remarry once they've died, uh, once one of their, spouses, uh, their spouse has died. So he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. So uh, married, the woman is bound to the husband she's married to as long as he's alive. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. She's no longer bound to that law. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And now the application in verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, even to him, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now, in the earlier chapters, particularly in chapter 6, Paul explained to us that in our becoming saved, that the Holy Spirit immersed us into Christ. And by being placed into Christ, we receive the benefits of what Christ is did for us. And what he did is he died. Well, we died with him. He was then buried. Our old life is not only dead, but buried with him. He was then raised from the dead, and we have been raised in newness of life. And water baptism is an example of the fact that something has happened to you. Your old life is over because you died with Christ. You were buried in Christ, and even as Jesus was raised from the dead, so you have been raised from the dead. And so the point that he's making here, particularly to the Jewish believers who had become Christians, there in verse 7, is that they had become dead to the law through the body of Christ, and so have you and I. In other words, Paul is beginning to lay out for us what our relationship 
as Christians is to the law. We are dead to the law because we have been buried with Christ and married to Christ who has been raised from the dead that we should bear fruit unto God. We're no longer under an obligation to the law because we have died in Christ. We were buried with Christ. We've been raised from the dead. We're now married to Christ. We're the bride of Christ. So our relationship has changed because of our coming to Christ and experiencing the benefits of what he has done for us. And you'll notice in the last part of verse 4 that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh or before we were saved, the passions of sins which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So before we were saved, the passions of sin, the principle of sin, were aroused by the law. The law identifies sin. The law was never given to save us, but rather to reveal sin to us. And an interesting thing about the law it does indeed arouse the passion to sin. Classic example, wet paint do not touch. You see the sign, what do you want to do? You want to touch the wet paint. Uh, You could have walked by that wall of wet paint not knowing that it was wet. You would have had absolutely no desire to touch it. But the knowledge of the fact that it is wet arouses within you a desire to do the exact thing that you're not supposed to do. And so the law was never meant to save us. It was meant to reveal to us that we are sinners. And so he says in verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the passions of sin, sins which were aroused by the law we're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So before we were saved, when we were under obligation to the law, we were bearing fruit unto death. But now, in verse 6, we have been delivered from the law. And how is it that we've been delivered from the law? He states it right here. Having died to what we were held by. So what Paul is stating is that our relationship with God is not a legal relationship. Our relationship with God is not based upon a legal foundation. It is based upon a gracious foundation. We have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. When you come to Christ, you you die. Another way of saying it is every person who comes to Christ is a new creature. We're born again. So we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So the whole metaphor about marriage is that If one of the spouses died, the other spouse was free to remarry. Well, no obligation anymore. And then he narrows it down to the individual. He says, you've died to the law, so you're free now from that law, and you were held by it, but you're free to have entered into this new relationship so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit. And so here he's identifying that not only is our relationship with God not based upon the law or a legal relationship, but it's based upon the person of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and not in the oldness of the letter. So we're no longer in a relationship or an attempt to have a relationship with God through the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? It's a fair question that somebody might ask. Paul's 
Answer, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, as far as Paul was concerned, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So, a very logical question, having just spent the first six verses saying, we really have no more relationship to the law. He says, well, is the law sin? If we have no relationship to it, is it sin? Absolutely not, Paul says. He says, just the opposite, as far as sin goes. He said, I would not have known sin except through the law. Now, if you go back with me, please, a few chapters to chapter 3, verse 20. Verse 19, chapter 3, verse 19, Paul had introduced this same subject as to the purpose of the law. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. And so here in chapter 7, Paul is saying, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Now, Paul is referencing here his understanding of the law prior to his conversion. And if we had the time to go into the book of Philippians, we would know that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees concerning the law. He said, I was blameless. He was one of the most religious, uh, wonderful examples of Judaism that you could possibly find. But there came a point in his life where God revealed to him what the law really demanded. He was, like all of the Pharisees whom Jesus had spoken to, who believed that all they were required to do to be pleasing to God was to outwardly observe the law. And so you'll remember in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said things like, you have heard that a man shall not commit adultery. And they would have all agreed, absolutely. And for many of them, they had not physically committed adultery. He said, but I say unto you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart. So what Jesus was beginning to do was to show what the law demanded, and what the law demanded was complete obedience, not merely outwardly, but inwardly. He went on to use other examples, such as murder. He said, you've heard that uh, you shall not commit murder. And they would have all said, oh yes, absolutely, we're right with you. And he said, but I'm saying to you, whoever is angry with his brother without just cause has committed murder already within his heart. So who of them had not lusted after a woman in their heart? None of them would have been able to say, no, not me. So all of them had. Who of them had never been angry with another person without just cause? So Jesus used about five or six examples like this to show them that what the law required was a standard of absolute perfection, which they had not been able to meet. They did meet it outwardly, but not inwardly. 
he ended that portion of the Sermon on the Mount by saying, therefore, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, anyone who is honestly thinking through that issue would come to the same conclusion as any other honest thinking person and say, well, then it's impossible for me to make it to heaven because I can't meet that standard. Well, Paul the Apostle was one of those Pharisees who had lived a good life outwardly. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he even said concerning the law, blameless. If you'd taken every one of those Ten Commandments and measured Paul's outward life next to them, he would have passed the test. But there was one commandment that God used to get to his heart. And it's the last of the ten. And it's the one dealing with covetousness. And in that commandment, it talks about not coveting your neighbor's wife and just not coveting in general. And so he says here in verse 7, at the last part of verse 7, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So God began to use the law to break through into Paul's heart showing him that deep within his heart he had been a covetous man. So he explains it then in verse 8 by saying, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment, and remember earlier we had talked about how the passions of sin are aroused by the law, now Paul became very aware of the fact that he had a problem with covetousness. Uh, God had made that clear to him. So Sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. Paul began to realize how covetous he was. He became self-aware of the fact that within himself he was a covetous person. And he says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. As Before he realized the intent of the law and the revelation of the law, as far as he was concerned, uh, Sin was dead. He was a righteous man. He wasn't aware of any sin within his life. He says in verse 9, I was alive once without the law before the law really did its work. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, his understanding up until that point was, well, if I just will obey the law, I'll have life. But he said, I found it now to bring death because I'm breaking God's commandment all the time. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. So the law is fundamentally good is what Paul is saying. But the result of the law is to bring into the open the power of sin. It is sin, not the law that exposes it, that deceives and kills. And so Paul realized he was a sinner, and he then was converted. And of course, he's no different than many people you would meet today. If you asked them if they believed in God, they would say yes. And if you were to ask them, well, are you going to go to heaven when you die? Uh, most unbelievers would say, well, I hope so. And then if you were to further question them and say, well, okay, so you're hoping to go to heaven, yes. Well, can you explain to me how is it that you're hoping to go to heaven? What do you mean you're hoping to go to heaven? And then they would say something like, well, I'm trying the best I can to be the best I can to get to heaven. So in other words, you're trying to get to heaven by being good. They'd say, well, yes, absolutely. And then if you said, well, well, how good do you have to be to get to heaven? Now, that would be a hard question for them to answer. Usually, they shift the blame at that point, as we do. And they'd say, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. And so then people begin to have this sliding scale of self-righteousness where they to some degree, admit their imperfection, but generally will say that they're better than these other bad people. 
I've rarely heard anyone say that they're worse than Adolf Hitler, but uh, they may have been in their heart. And so many people are just like Paul. They believe that by that what God wants from them is to be good, and if they're good enough, then they'll get to heaven. And what Paul is saying, the law was never intended to be a ladder to get you to heaven, but rather a mirror to show you that you're not going to heaven, and to point you, and to be a tutor, and to help you understand that there is a way to get to heaven. And that way to get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, an interesting thing here is that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And so he paid the price for the sins of the whole world. The only sin that is unpardonable is what? It's the sin of not believing in Jesus Christ. That's the sin that will keep people out of heaven. And so Jesus would say things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. And so a person, when they finally come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which every true born-again Christian, even if they were born again at age five, or at age 50, they come to a point of realizing, you know what? I'm a sinner. I've broken God's law. And God would be perfectly just and perfectly right if he condemned me to hell. People come to that realization. They also come to the realization that not only are they not righteous, but they come to the realization of the fact that God loves them and that Jesus Christ has died for their sins and that if they'll turn to Christ and receive Christ into their life and believe in him, then they'll be saved. And so it's at that point that a person either believes in God or turns away from him. And thus, uh, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and everyone who does not call upon the name of the Lord will not be saved. So in verse 13, Paul says, Has then what is good become death to me? Still talking about the law. Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And so he's just repeating in one sense that there's nothing wrong with the law at all. The law did its job in Paul's case, and that is that it caused sin to appear. He says, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The law helped him to see how sinful he really was. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal or a man of the flesh, sold or in bondage to sin. He goes now with another uh, issue in his life and his past, and that is now that he had become a Christian, even though he was saved and no longer under the law, he still struggled with sin, but he explains it from a different perspective. Let me read it, and then we'll go back through and look at it. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Paul had some confusion. This is his own experience as a believer. And it's his diagnosis of what happens also when a person tries to be holy by keeping the law. And he had to learn all of this. He said, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Now, 
if you were to stop and say, well, what is it Paul wanted to do? Well, he wanted to obey God. But he's so, for what I will to do, that I do not practice, he found himself not practicing what he wanted to do. But what he hated, which was not obeying God, he found himself doing. That was his condition, and it's the condition of every Christian. What I will to do, that I do not practice. We don't always do what we want to do. The things that we hate that we don't want to do, we wind up doing. So he then draws some conclusions and understanding then of this. He says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. If I'm doing what I will not to do, if I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, that I know are wrong, I agree with the law that it's good. The law is telling the truth. It's good for me to obey the law. It's wrong for me to disobey it. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my sinful nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law or a principle that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So it's important for us to recognize that when Paul the Apostle was converted, he was a baby Christian. Uh, the Lord had to speak to him. The Lord had to teach him, and indeed the Lord did. But Paul struggled uh, in his early Christian life and to the end of his life, but he struggled essentially in the earlier part of his life with the issues that he's dealing with here, which is, I want to do what God wants me to do, but I wind up not doing it. He was trying to obey the law of God, but he didn't do a very good job. So he says, well, if I then do what I will not to do, if I'm doing the things that I don't want to do, then I'm agreeing the law is good. It, it is good. But now in verse 17, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He began to realize, you know, there's something in me called sin. I want to do what's good, but I wind up not doing it. So I'm agreeing that the law is good, and I'm realizing that there's something dwelling in me called sin. He went on to further understand in verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. He was saying, you know, there's really nothing good about me. I want to do what's right, but I really don't know how to do it. I'm trying to do the right things that I know God wants me to do. But how to do it, I don't know how. Verse 19, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. The good things that I know I should do, that I want to do, I'm not doing them. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. The evil things that I don't want to do, I wind up doing. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Let's look at that again a little closer. Verse 20. 
if I'm doing what I don't want to do, it's no longer me who's doing it, but it's sin that dwells in me. There's this power in me that's doing this. I find then a law or a reality or a principle that evil is present with me, even though he was a Christian. I don't have to convince you of this fact. You know, when I first became a Christian, I lived this out to the T. I thought that being a Christian meant that you stopped doing the things that you formerly had done. Now, initially, when I first became a Christian, for a period of time, I call it almost a honeymoon period. You're just so elated that you're a Christian. You're, you're just filled with a great sense of joy and peace, and, and you're not really aware of too much except of the fact that God has forgiven you of your sin, and you're thrilled to, to be in this new life. But after a while, you start doing things that you know you shouldn't do and you don't want to do, but you do them. And I thought to myself, well, Christians shouldn't do these things. Christians don't do these things, but I'm doing them. There must be something wrong with me. And not only was I doing them, and please don't let your imagination go too wild. Uh, think of your own life. You just use your own life if you want to imagine something. You don't need to worry about me. We're all men of like passions. But not only was I doing things, but I realized I wanted to do things. And again, I thought, well, Christians don't want to do these kinds of things. There must be something wrong with me. Surely other Christians aren't like me. That's what I thought. And I seriously considered taking my own life. I became so despondent over my failure to be the Christian that I thought I should be. I never told anyone about it, but I became so discouraged. I would put on a smile every day. How are you doing? Oh, just great, thank you. But inside I was so miserable because I was failing God as far as I was concerned. And somehow or another, just quietly, God slowly brought me little by little to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. And like Paul, uh, and I hope like you, you begin to realize that there is actually this other law or principle that's present with you, the one who wills to do good. Now, the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is that the non-Christian lives in complete harmony with their sinful self. They have no problem sinning. They just sin right along. They're happy. They boast about it. They talk about it on Monday morning. They involve themselves with as many other like-minded sinners as possible, and they have a great time, and life is pretty harmonious for them. But once you become a Christian, you're no longer living in harmony with sin for a number of reasons. First of all, the old you is dead. There's a new person living inside of you. The problem is there is also still the presence of evil or the principle of sin. Its power over you has been broken. It no longer dominates you as it formerly had, but it's still there warring against you. It's like an army that just won't give up. It's an internal struggle. And so the Christian begins to realize, you know, yes, I'm a Christian, I've been saved, but I have a problem with sin. Sin is still dwelling within me. He went on to further explain himself in verse 22 for Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. Inside, I, I'm so happy with the things of God, but I see another law in my members. He's just repeating himself, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. His 
discouraged state of mind is listed for us in verse 24. This is how Paul, as a Christian, would describe himself at this point. Oh, wretched man that I am. He was a complete failure as far as he was concerned. And then he asks this question. Not what, but who will deliver me from this body of death? Who is going to help me with the problem of sin? I don't want to sin, but I keep sinning. I want to do what's right, but I don't do what's right. There's a problem. It's sin within me. I'm a wretched sinner. Who's going to deliver me from this problem of sin? The answer is found in verse 25. But I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he realized that it was the Lord who is the deliverer, and that as a Christian, with his mind, his heart, he wants to serve the law of God, but with the flesh, or sin, he serves the law of sin. But he's beginning to explain now how to live the Christian life. And there is a freedom in the Christian life. And he starts in verse 1 of chapter 8 by saying, first of all, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So he's introducing another facet of the reality of his life and of our lives as Christians, and that is that because we are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. Now, Jesus himself said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to what? To condemn the world, but that the world through him would what? Might be saved. If you are in Christ, you have died with Christ, buried with Christ, raised with Christ in the newness of life. Your sins are forgiven you. And the fact that Jesus Christ was received up into heaven is the proof of his acceptance into heaven. And all who are in Christ are also accepted by God in heaven. We have access to God by one spirit through faith in Christ. So if you're in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation. Who do not walk or live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the person who is no longer unsaved, but now a saved person. You're living or walking according to the spirit, the Christian is not a person whom God is condemning. For the law or the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So in verse 2, what Paul is saying is that there is a greater law or a greater principle or a greater power than the law and the principle and the power of sin, and that is the law of the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. And it's Him, it's he, him, who has made me free from the law of sin and death. How is that? We have died with him. We have been buried with him. We've been raised into newness of life. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, the law could not save me. And the reason it couldn't is because of the weakness of my own flesh, my inability to obey the law. So... The law could not save me because of my own weakness. 
So God saved me by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. We're human beings. Jesus Christ became a human being. And so God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin or because of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh by dying for it. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. What is the righteous requirement of the law? Well, first of all, the law requires that debts must be paid. The wages of sin is death. We owed, we owed a payment for our sins, and that is death. What did Jesus do? He died. He was then raised from the dead, and he was received up into heaven. And what does the law require? Complete righteousness. Jesus is described as he who knew no sin. So Jesus fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. And so being placed into Christ, the law has been fulfilled, if you will. The righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled for us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those of us who are no longer living as unsaved people, but we're living as saved people. Jesus is the one who is fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law. Verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh, or unbelievers, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Non-Christians are thinking about what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, and what they're going to wear and what they're going to do. But those who live according to the Spirit, Christians, their minds are on the things of the Spirit. Our minds are involved with the things of God. For to be carnally minded or fleshly minded, or to be an unbeliever is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We have life through the life of Christ. We have peace with God through faith in Christ. We have the peace of God as we walk with him and allow him to lead us. Because the carnal mind or the fleshly mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Unsaved people are enemies of God. They are against God. They're not subject to the law of God, and they can't be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. An unsaved person cannot please God. A saved person can please God because they are in Christ, and the one thing that God requires is what? They that come to God must first, what? Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, that's what is pleasing to the Lord is when we believe him. And this is, I also believe, why God wants us to be in the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's an interesting thing you find great satisfaction. The more you really get into the word, the more satisfied you are, but the hungrier you are for it. Have you ever had those times when you are going to bed at night and you think, I just can't wait to get up in the morning to actually seek the Lord, read the Bible, and do the things of God? I would imagine you have. There probably have been times too when you go to bed and you have don't have God on your mind because your mind has not been on the Lord. But the thing that pleases God is to believe him. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's no way an unsaved person can please God because they don't believe God. And again, that's the unpardonable sin. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You're not 
dead in your sins, but you're alive, you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You say, oh, okay. Paul is speaking to the believers there. He says, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. You're, you, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If the Holy Spirit is in you, it means you're a Christian. Well, how do you know if the Holy Spirit is in you? What's the evidence of the Holy Spirit being in you? What does he produce? He produces what? Fruit. And the one, really one word that is really the description of all the fruit that's listed in Galatians is, Galatians is love. That's what he produces. That's how we know that we really are, that we really do have the Holy Spirit in us. So, but you were not in the flesh, verse 9, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. So, if someone does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, they do not belong to God. He is the seal of God's ownership in your life, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So he's making this distinction by saying, first of all, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, your, your old life is dead, but... The spirit is life because of righteousness. You've been given a brand new life. Your spirit has been, you've been given spiritual life. You're alive. You were dead because of sin, but now you're, li you're alive because of the righteousness of God. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So your body's actually dead because of sin and it's dying. But if the spirit, the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead is also going to give life to your mortal bodies. Through his spirit who dwells in you, one day you will be resurrected by God. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to our old life, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is what's called mortification, not a word we use every day. How are you doing today? Well, I'm involved in mortification. You, you try saying that to somebody and they're going to say, pardon me. So, oh yes, I'm involved in mortification. I mean, we use words like mortified or mortify, but we don't use the word mortification. The word mortify is used in the book of Colossians, and what it's speaking about is uh, putting to death the deeds of the flesh. He says in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you mortify the deeds of the body, by the Spirit you will live. Now right here is what Paul came to find out. The way to deal with the problems of sin is not by my trying to overcome sin by not doing it and being a better Christian, but rather by my depending on the Holy Spirit. He has been sent and given to you as a helper. So our trust is in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us. This is why the Bible is constantly saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
receive God's power in your life to help you. So, as the Christian is seeking to be involved in putting off the sins of the flesh, what a Christian can do is to acknowledge their sin to God and say, Lord, I can't overcome this sin on my own. You know, even the 12-step Alcoholics Anonymous programs have come to realize people need help. They can't overcome these problems on their own. And it's the same for the Christian. So whatever sin or sins you're trying to deal with, Paul is saying, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And in a, in a big picture, really, you've done that. You've become saved and you've put off the deeds of the flesh, but, but in the day-to-day -day living, the, the sins that you may be dealing with. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Maybe it's a problem of lust. Maybe it's a problem of anger. Maybe whatever it is, of lying, stealing, whatever the problems are, whatever problems any unsaved person has, a Christian person can still have to deal with those. They may have a propensity. Maybe it's homosexuality or lesbianism or uh, cursing or adultery or fornication or whatever it might be. And you don't want to do those things but you find yourself doing them. And you realize that, that I have this problem. I'm a Christian. How am I going to deal with these problems? I need God's Holy Spirit to help me. Lord, would you please help me? He's the Spirit of holiness. Would you please fill me? I'm confessing my sins to you. I, I want to depend on you. I need you to empower me. I need you to strengthen me. So Romans chapter 8 here is talking about the power to live a holy life. In the last part of chapter 7, Paul was learning about the struggle that he still had with sin. He said, Christ is the one who will redeem me. He'll help me. There isn't, I'm not condemned, even though I have these, I fall into sin, I'm still positionally not condemned. There's no condemnation, but how do I actually deal with sin? I do it by mortifying the deeds of the body by trusting in the Holy Spirit. Let's read verse 13 again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So the deeds of the body that need to be put to death, you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to put those deeds to death. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Persons who trust in the Holy Spirit to lead them, they're the children of God. Unbelievers are not seeking the Holy Spirit's help. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So, when you were born again, you didn't receive a spirit of bondage again to fear. You were in bondage but you've received the spirit of adoption. A change has taken place. You've been adopted. By whom, through the Holy Spirit, we cry out to our Father. The Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He, he's the one who tells you that you are indeed a child of God. And if children, if we're His children... Not only are we his children, but then we're heirs. We're heirs of God. And we're joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So Paul is speaking here about a number of things beginning in verse 12. First of all, we, do not, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. You do not have to live the way that you used to live. If you live that way, you're going to die. But if 
through the Holy Spirit's help, you put to death the deeds of the body, you're actually going to live. And as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. That should encourage you to know you indeed are his child. You've re you have received the spirit of adoption. We have a family here that has just adopted some girls, two girls. And typically, when a child is adopted into a family, typically, that child is made, and the, uh, the wording here, as we just are seeing, is you are made a full member of the family. You're not a, uh, you know, you're not less than the other children. You're, you have been adopted into the family, so if there are the natural children and then there are these adopted children, they're the equally children of that family. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit tells you that. And if you are a child of God, then you also are an heir of God. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We share the same inheritance as Christ has. We're joint heirs with Christ. He is the heir of God. He's the heir, it says in Hebrews, of all things. Everything that exists, and now this is what I love to talk about. He is the heir of all things. So you start thinking about, well, what is included in all things? Well, let me tell you, all. All things include all. Everything that there is, is included in all. And we live in a galaxy. There are billions of galaxies. There is an infinite existence. There is an eternal existence, and the Father has made Jesus Christ the heir of everything. That's a lot. I looked up the word everything. Guess what it means? It's like the word all. It means all. You and I are not only adopted children, but we're heirs of God. Well, he's going to get a lot, and we'll get a little bit less. I mean, you go to an actual reading of a will, uh, you get 100000 you get a dollar. Oh, thank you so much. No, no. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So if he's the heir of all things, and we're joint heirs with him, my understanding is everything that he receives, we are too. You say, well, wait a minute. If there's something to be given and I give it to you, how can I also give it to you? Well, God can do the impossible. He's able to give everything to all of his children. And then he says in the last part of verse 17, if indeed we suffer with him. Now he's changing the tone a little bit here from, oh great, inheritance, that's in the future. But you know what? If indeed we suffer with him and we do suffer with him, the sufferings of Christ. Jesus said these kinds of things. He said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I know that many Christians are being persecuted, especially now after these rulings this last week. They're having to take a stand for what they believe. You'll be persecuted for taking a godly stand. You better be sure of that. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Remember, the carnal mind is at enmity with God. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will what? They'll hate you. So if indeed we suffer with Christ, and we do suffer with Christ. Now, I think a lot of suffering for suffering can be brought on by us that Jesus is saying, I don't know why you did that. That's not suffering for me. That's suffering for stupidity. You know, so often young Christians are so zealous 
uh, they get themselves in a lot of, they put themselves in positions where they, they find people disliking them, not really because they're Christians, but just because they're being annoying. And so we need to have wisdom in living the Christian life. But if you have wisdom and are living the Christian life, you can be sure you will suffer for him. Take a stand for Jesus and see what happens. But that's not the end of the story. He says, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, so Paul has gone from chapter 7 saying, look, we're no longer under the law because we've died with Christ. So we no longer have this legal relationship. But don't think the law is bad. Oh, no, no. The law is good. Because the law is what shows us our need for a Savior. The law reveals our need for a Savior. He said, I, would, he said, I thought I was doing good until the law really got a hold of me. And then I realized what a sinner I was. And then even after becoming a Christian, I still thought, well, I have to obey the law of God. And he said, I was trying and trying. Couldn't do it. I tried to do the right thing. Couldn't do it. Was doing the wrong thing. I'm a wretched person. Who's going to help me? Jesus will help me. I thank God through Jesus Christ. He'll redeem me. He'll help me. And wait a minute. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's the position I have. What the law couldn't do because of my weakness, God did in sending Christ. He sent him as a man, and, and he died as a man, and he's been accepted into heaven as a man. And all who were in him are accepted by God. That's the only way we can please God. By believing in him. And Paul is talking then of, well, how... You deal with your sin is by the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting in God. Now, just as a matter of fact for a moment, and we're going to have to end here with verse 18. Obviously, we can't go through the whole chapter tonight. But just as a matter of fact, on a practical level, let's talk for a moment about what this really means to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver you from sin. Well, first of all, it does involve the confession of our sin. It does involve the forgiveness of our sin. It does involve God cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He teaches you and he leads you into the things of God. So when you say to the Holy Spirit, would you please help me to put off sin, he's going to lead you to confession. He's going to lead you in the paths of righteousness. He'll show you what to do. He'll teach you what to do. He is a person. And he lives right inside of you. And he's holy. And he's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He knows every little thing about you. He knows where you are, what you're thinking. So when you ask him to help you, he's going to lead you in the right direction. And you know, pretty soon you find yourself saying, you know what, not only do I not want to do those things, but I really don't want to do them. And I'm not doing them. Oh, and you might fall back into it, but you know what? You're going to go back towards the way of the Lord. And pretty soon you find yourself with a different interest, a different appetite, and you find that freedom in Christ. You've been adopted. You're being led by the Spirit of God. You're a child of God. You're an heir of God. Paul is just thinking forwardly to what's coming. You ever wonder... How much is in the will of the people who you think might have you in their will? Is that a no? Nobody ever thinks that? I'm the only one? Sure you do. You wonder, well, I wonder how much they left me. You know, I've told you this story before, but my brother, he has many millions of dollars. He sold his house for 
eight or nine million dollars recently. And a couple of years ago, I was with him, and we we're just sitting talking. He's 11 years older than I am. He calls me Robert, and he's just out of nowhere. We're talking about nothing. He says, Robert, and I said, yes, Bill. He said, I'm putting my affairs in order. And I said, okay. And he said, you take care of your family. Now, we're stepbrothers. But at that moment, I thought, I am, I am family. I'm thinking to myself, I am family, and I wanted to ask him in the worst way, are you telling me that I take care of family, meaning my blood family and not my step family? Or are you telling me we are family and I'm going to take care of you? You'll be happy to know I refrain myself from asking him that question. But I've asked my wife probably 50 times, honey, what do you think he meant by that? And she gets annoyed with me. She said, I don't know. And I said, well, but give me your best guess. And I'm just wanting her to tell me. And she ought to just tell me, you know, I think he means he's going to leave you a million dollars. I'd say, oh, good, that solves the problem. For all I know, he's leaving it all to the Humane Society. I don't know. But I do know this. I'm in God's will, and so are you. That's for sure. Well, how much are you in God's will? You're a joint heir with Christ. How about that? Down here we suffer with him. But notice the, verse, the last part of verse 17, that we may also be glorified together. That's where he is today. We'll just stop at verse 17 and we'll pick it up at verse 18, though the thoughts go together so well. Um, let's have the ushers come on up, please. I know we were going to play that song, but we will not play it uh, now. Read 5, 6, 7, and 8 over and over and over and try to get in the flow of what's said in these chapters because they really they flow together so well. Let's pray. Father, we're bringing to you the basket as it were and acknowledging that we also were once in bondage. We were in the strange land of death and of darkness, of sin and of Satan. But Father, you've brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of life and light with Jesus Christ. And we bring to you now the first. We bring to you the tithe, your tithe. And we bring it to you as an act of worship. And we ask that you receive it from us as such. And Lord, we thank you for your provision for step one in the low power FM radio station and we pray Lord that you would lead us carefully along step by step according to your will it is according to your will not to ours so we commit all of that to what you want to do we love you father in Jesus name amen